yeah we can start thanks hi uh, good evening everyone uh, this is uh, uh, the school of environment and architecture and i welcome you all to see conversations uh, for the cycle of monsoon this year and uh, uh, this uh, series started uh, the first session of the series happened in the uh, two weeks ago uh, where we had chal chal agency talking to us uh, and today we have the second uh, talk for the curated series uh, building agency uh, before i get into a uh, uh, kind of briefing you about this i want to say that see conversations is uh, uh, a cultural platform for dialogue on uh, various kinds of issues related to architecture and design and allied cultural disciplines uh, uh, which help us expand our own radius of thinking about space and spatiality and under this uh, uh, this initiative uh, we have been conducting lectures uh, for the last 6 uh, and a half 7 years now uh, and we are very um, uh, kind of uh, related to share that all these uh, most of these lectures have been archived on our c youtube channel so you all can access the previous lectures on our c youtube channel the link of which is on our website um, and uh, we also invite you to join the subsequent lectures uh, under our uh, c conversations with the information of which is available on uh, our website regularly uh so uh coming to uh, my name is anuj daga by the way and i teach at the school of environment and architecture um and uh, i'm very happy to uh, invite all of you to join the discussion today uh, we are uh, having studio matter talk to us under our curated series building agency which basically is a series specifically uh, thought around the uh, thought around um the idea of uh, addressing the question of how does architecture become relevant for and in the society today um and the, there are two dimensions to this question the first is the idea of uh, spatial design and how it shapes social relationships and second is how a spatial practitioner can contribute more responsibly and potently into the emerging complexities of spatial operation so uh with that uh, kind of brief background uh, i am very uh, happy to have uh, uh representatives from matter today matter is uh, uh, uh is a kind of uh, a team of uh, very uh, inspired individuals who have been who have kind of uh, Uh, been operating in this in the field of architecture in a very multi-dimensional way uh, it was established as a juxtaposition of the two passions shared between ruturaj parik and mansi hatangri who will be talking to us today uh, and uh, it was founded as a design plus content studio uh, where their uh, where their interest was in uh, designing buildings and built environment Uh, environments and investing in public discourse with a keen focus on the south asian region uh and uh, today they'll talk about uh, 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 uh about the various engagements that they have had vis-a-vis -vis their diverse practice uh and a little more about uh, uh, ruturaj uh, and mansi they founded matter in um uh, both of them founded matter which is an interdisciplinary architecture design and publishing studio like i said uh and um, it it works in the interface of architecture and content uh while they while experimenting with different ways of engaging with the built environment um uh, and uh, their their content uh, platform uh, aims to instigate meaningful discussions to celebrate the diversity and richness of design ideas um and uh, they are very interested in kind of understanding the context of the south asian region particularly india uh, and as an architecture studio matter has conceived and executed projects of multiple scales and in various contexts with built and conceptual work in the portfolio in their portfolio over the last 6 years um uh, rudraj has been the former director of the charles kuria foundation where he led social projects and public uh, forum initiatives and he's also the curator and editor of think matter which is a digital media platform for contemporary indian architecture and inside which is a biannual profession design journal uh, they've also kind of uh, uh, some of you might be 
knowing that they have also initiated a lot of uh, uh, archival projects also um and uh, i'm sure that uh, uh, they'll talk about it uh, in their uh, in their uh, uh, presentation so so with that i invite ruturaj and mansi to lead us through experiments of matter welcome ruturaj and mansi over to you thanks uh, thanks anuj and uh, thank you uh, sea for hosting us um, we were just uh, talking that um, how nice it would have been to be in bombay and to present this in person and unfortunately Dutraja, could you hold your mic a bit closer sure let's see is this better yeah, yeah. yes okay <clears throat> now i was just saying that how how nice it would have been to be um, in person in bombay and uh, to present this like le lecture especially when you see you know uh, when you are across the room i mean it's such a much more effective but hopefully sometime soon and uh, uh, i i i can uh, dive straight in um yeah. i'll share my screen yeah yes yes okay so the talk is titled thinking in practice um <clears throat> and uh, uh, i just want to start by saying that uh, while i present this uh, uh, talk i only present in behalf of Uh, matter i am not matter i don't uh, presume to be the practice the practice is very different from uh, what i am and it um and and a practice is i believe enriched by a lot of different people and it it is not it's no longer a domain of an individual let's say um so with with that i would uh, that uh, i i i would share this work and these ideas uh, uh which are uh, some some of these ideas are foundational let's say principles of our practice and the work forms more or less the backdrop or an extension of those i those principles so um and and the two two uh, uh, what anuj had articulated uh, you know um uh, in in this search for an agency let's say uh, these two uh, um aspects of work one which we one which he articulated uh, as partial design which is the outcome of a say the outcomes of the practice and the partial practice itself which is the um you know the uh, um the idea of the office and work and the psych, the, the the feedback loop and the repetition so <clears throat> um uh, like it was read in our introduction that we are a um we are a practice with two kind of uh, core um uh, you know uh, verticals we have a design practice and architecture practice which deals with um the questions of architecture and design of space of planning of um urban design of uh, typologies and of uh, 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 basically uh, it is a it is a uh, um uh, it is a consultancy and a research oriented practice and the other aspect of our work which is um uh, which we articulate as content is um uh, is really a, a a sort of forum or a, a a lens for us to engage with course on architecture and design in india and through that we have we curate publications seminars conferences uh content initiatives uh, some of them you might be aware of some of them i'll co cover in this talk uh, i'll sprint through the talk because i i don't intend to linger on projects i i i don't want to present the work so much as uh, i just want to um share some principles uh some core values let's say of our practice and then we can dive straight on into conversation so uh, it's a bit longish uh, so i'll 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 try and make it quick um matter was originally found uh, in 2014 by me and mansi as an agency to make and think about architecture and um <clears throat> to make architecture was let's say my passion i wanted to be uh, i wanted to build let uh, you know in a simple like if i have to put it simply 
and uh, uh, thinking architecture was always something that we shared coming from the background of being editors of a magazine and um, uh, engaged with the discourse on architecture in india um, and uh, mansi um, also uh, did her masters from in history theory and criticism so for her this rigorous uh, quest of knowledge for architecture became somehow a part of this practice became very important um, i wanted to share uh, i wanted to start with this this was my my dissertation project my thesis project and uh, one of the uh, one of the things about the uh, thesis project is uh, you are kind of your know, final year project is you are kind of on your own uh, so it's a bit of a free fall and i always felt that the the kind of uh, i took a rather long time to to finish this more than a year and uh, slowly um, and a lot of um, you know a lot of consider a lot of times i visited the site this is badra it is the heart of ahmedabad where the brown bits are existing bits and the white bits are conceptually the interventions but but what i learned from my thesis is that um, is that the rigor of writing um, on uh, about architecture and the the rigor of trying to articulate thought in architecture um uh, i worked with intact for some time and then uh, as you know as uh, um uh, um be both me and mansi were editors of this magazine so indian architecture and at that time when we joined was about 25 years old it was an old magazine and what we wanted to do is we wanted to look sharply at india uh, we uh, the magazine used to publish a lot of international projects and a lot of very very fine images and we thought uh, that that do not resonate with who we are and what so our our uh, uh, in india I, we don't mean the geographical the, the political boundaries of india basically the indian subcontinent india the enormous you know southwest uh, including bangladesh pakistan nepal uh, you know bhutan uh, sri lanka and and the and the monsoon uh, southwest another important thing that happened as we were on the verge of leaving uh, uh, in an architecture builder towards the <coughs> uh, towards the leeward end of it is when we uh, met charles korea and he was uh, he had wrapped up korea had wrapped uh, kind of closed his office and he was in the process of organizing um, uh, organizing um, his archives to be shared and sent to uh, riba the royal institute of Brit british architects and one of the things that we did in this uh, you know a small part of our engagement with him was to digitize vistar and vistar was a catalog of a very popular very uh, a landmark 1985 exhibition curated by charles korea pupul jay karun uttam jain and uh, uh, vistar um uh, also the, 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 there were a very few catalogs available and that we thought by digitizing it will you know uh, extend the life of the whole idea and in the process we realized that uh, their way of looking at architecture was not purely in a linear historic way the way we had learned in school but rather when they looked at architecture of india uh, they looked at this architecture from the view of the trying to excavate the ideas within so it was a revelation for us actually this as we and what was after we uh, went through the process of digitizing and uh, let's say um, digitally reproducing remastering the whole document some of the sites we visited um, or revisited from the whole, from the experience of the book um, this is the sun temple in morera uh, pushkar and mandu and through our travels uh, to these places and the time we spent there we uh, started to relate more viscerally to the experience of architecture of india and to what does it mean when we say the architecture of india um so uh, our five or six issues of the magazine that we edited these uh, illustrated essays were published and these essays basically through these five different ideas 
talked about the core um, principles of what we understood as the architecture of India. Uh, water, uh, crossing of cultures, code of the habitat, patterns of settlement and order. And all these five essays uh, went across the historic timeline, picked up uh, you know, a, a very disparate uh, and a very distinct uh, examples from across the Indian subcontinent and tried to relate them to certain core principles on which they are found. These were the, how the layouts looked. And it was a wonderful effort because we really um, drew almost everything that was a part of this document. Um, and in the process of drawing them, um, we uh, started understanding them better. When we moved uh, here uh, to Goa, uh, I was engaged with the foundation and Mansi was trying to set up the practice. And initially it was not, we never thought of it as a design and building an architecture practice in that sense. We were always more inclined to um, establish matter as a content studio uh, through which we could do publications and we could host conferences and we could basically be engaged with the discourse of architecture in India. But one of the earlier uh, projects that came to us was in the form of this small birdhouse. Um, uh, a friend's friend, she runs an NGO in Bangalore and she approached us to basically design something out of recycled tetra pack. And they work with women in uh, you know, low cost settlements where they, their day job is to recycle this tetra pack, uh, which cannot be industrially recycled and turn this tetra pack into objects. And one of the things that we designed uh, were, was this little birdhouse uh, that kind of collapsed and the bird stick became the structure. It was a very simple uh, design process. And it, 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 it is basically made and folded out of a single sheet of paper so that that's how they started making it. And the bird stick is there. So both of these things collapse and go into a small envelope that can be posted because they wanted to send them across India to make people who make donations. And um, we learned uh, that uh, design is not an isolated process that um, can happen in uh, sparks of genius. We re realized that even through small projects that uh, the engagement of multiple stakeholders, including us is very important. We have to listen to everybody. Um, and then we have to also be professionals. We have to deliver on our commitment as professionals towards the project. This was one of the first uh, projects that we got through. Uh, so uh, Pradeep Kodikara and Jineshi, who are friends who, who practice in Sri Lanka, they had got this commission to do a small house in Goa. And this was our first project also. Uh, so the, the sort of learning in this project, uh, it was a very, in a way, it looks strangely like the birdhouse that we designed. Uh, so it, it so th therefore, I'm quite fond of it. And uh, it had no overhangs, and you know, we had we had made some fundamental mistakes on in kind of dealing with the, the because we came uh, from Ahmedabad, right? I mean, it's a it's an arid, dry, uh, hot, dry uh, place which has very this beautiful sharp uh, sunlight. While we moved to Goa, we realized that that's not that's not the climate, and it it's a it was a shock re revelation because we designed this building in the interim, and we realized that oh my god, you know, we have made this flat, tall, flat walls, and have those windows who are just recessed, and those are sharp cubicles that are open to sky. And of course, it's very beautiful, very romantic, but it was it it's still like mean, we are we continue to engage with this building, trying to waterproof it somehow. It was a very simple plan. Um, it uh, has a borrowed garden as the British say and then it has this uh, uh, triple height space here which is the atrium for the living and then it has it's it has some five small bedrooms and that's that on the left is the house from the borrowed garden and on the right uh, uh, it's the atrium and you can see this ugly um, polycarb sheet which was unfortunately added <laughs> to protect those areas below from monsoon so again, it's it's a pro, uh, I mean this this house still astonishes how much I learned from it. But being the first project, we also uh, realized that if you are um, architects and if you are especially architects in India, you have to engage with 
uh, a lot of people and a lot of skills and a lot of uh, ideas that have to do with the way our buildings are tactile uh, or made tactile uh, you know simple things like masonry carpentry uh, you can see the horrible way in which that railing is put together uh, the, the plumbing and the uh, electrical points and stuff like that uh, going back to uh, uh, so this was this was sort of our take off uh, years and going back to the the whole um, the the background from which we come uh, and especially our time the time that we spent we were fortunate to spend with charles korea we realized that um, if we we have to have an architecture practice and if we have to want to do what we want to do uh, we have to engage with the art of authoring and by authoring we mean not only um, write or discuss or talk or articulate the ideas in architecture by authoring we also mean authoring and and that is one learning that we have from charles korea you know there are many um, in his uh, when we looked at his work in his incredible you know uh, career as an architect or professional we realized that almost 70% of what he did was initiated by him the large master plans new bombay um, the regional plan of goa the national commission on urbanization and many many typological thought, thoughts that were uh, and many of them unbuilt still were uh, were came from his ability to articulate thought and his ability to author this in the form of um, so vistar continues to remain and vistar and a lot of other documents like this continue to remain very close to our practice i refer to them very frequently when i moved to goa i worked for about two and a half years at the charles korea foundation and in the foundation we uh, used to uh, engage with projects like this uh, these were all self initiated projects uh, we read about the terrible condition in which goa's anganwadi is where we started a survey uh, and we uh, sachin akshikar we, we engaged sachin's help in redesigning or redesigning a prototype and mr korea was around at this time so he made this beautiful sketch with a rectangle and you know four rooms in four corners and this central space which becomes sort of the place for children and uh, uh, unfortunately he wasn't around when the building got completed but we wanted to design this uh, as a prototype and it is uh, you know received as one i mean it's one of the nicest small anganwadis that i have visited and they are very proud of it at least the people who to whom it, it belongs it was built at at uh, pwd costs uh, you know all the items were listed in the standard uh, rate list so it was built at it's a very low spec building but it still compels me even still i, I revert in just a um, year and a half back we me mansi a lot of friends bauna who worked on it uh, with with a group of students from delhi revisited this center and it was so lovely to see how it is being used so one of the things that we do in at matter is to kind start kind of you know push to engage with projects that that is sometimes are self initiated sometimes outside or uh, you know the traditional client architect relationship and um, and the idea of waste is one such idea i mean we have been off and on engaged with it right now it's off it will be on some you know in a bit um but uh, goa has a big problem of waste and not just because of tourism because of the kind of consumptive capitalist life that we all live and um, we uh, we engaged with the goa to the waste management corporation to design this uh, simple very very effective um, and very very low cost uh, waste sorting centers you know where they wanted people who are sorting wastes from the village to deal with uh, i mean to work in an environment which has some dignity uh, and we did a lot of prototypes we it's still in process we have got a lot of these uh, i mean there this is one of the prototypes there are about six different ones different capacities but what happened in the process is that we they they found this bus and there was a very nice a very very agile um, uh, bureaucrat uh, sanjit who is now the commissioner here 
and he was at the, he at that time led the um, so sometimes you also need people like them in if you are to engage with you know in in the in the municipalities and in the government if you are to engage with them long term but they found this bus and what happens with these buses is that they retire at about a lakh meters into uh, the whole thing they they put these buses to rest and then they are scrap valued and and the thing about these buses is that they have still have a good um in they, they 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 go through hell on indian roads but they still have their bodies a wreck but the engine is still in place and it looks like this you know you we all are aware of this uh, we all all have traveled in this these compartments so uh, we documented the bus and we decided uh, so goa in also has a festivals and um, it's it hosts a lot of events and all these event venues are in this uh, very eco sensitive locations you know near the sea sometimes uh, on on grass on on fields uh, where different grasses grow and so waste uh, collect, collecting and organizing waste in these event venues is a big issue and very simple this was uh, very simple drawings we made we didn't make any shop drawings we worked with the body builders we ripped the bus apart and we introduced what you could see can see here from inside we took off all the chairs we redid the floor um whatever we could retain we retained and we introduced this kind of uh foldable bins you know segregation bins they fold out in this way so on site you can park one of these buses and then you can segregate the waste on site and as the event wraps up the bus can leave and it can come back to the we also designed the graphics uh, strangely this graphics have become graphics of all waste collection vehicles in panjim so it's very uncanny uh, and and when it came back from the body shop it looked like this uh, the roof was still the same the body was changed we added a ramp at the back just to make it more but you you could see those foldable bins so every time a bin is full they can pull it back inside they can remove the bag they can uh, re you replace the bag and push it back out it was a nice television screen so that you know some branding some flashy government uh, propaganda can play from there and this is how uh, it looks in up close and as you can see the detail is e e extremely high tech <laughs> high tech uh, those are like really kitchen drawer handles and yeah i mean but the body building in uh, especially in the government depot is is a process of salvage all the time so all of these little things are also upcycled you know found and placed uh, one of the important uh, uh, aspects of our work is our search uh, what i think is of for the essential idea and uh, um uh, the the essential idea to me is is uh, our ability to uh, you know understand the project and the program it in a way that we approach the heart of it without distractions to start with you know what is the project about uh, is this project about uh, sorting waste is uh, i don't know is this project about is this house about trying to look for better ways of living is this uh, development about save a part of the forest uh, so so the essential idea is to me uh, at the core of all projects and all works that we do <coughs> we are always conscious of what what are we trying to achieve and, and not in absolute and not in not in explicit terms but even intuitively if we feel that we have something to contribute then it becomes a project for us um this is a conceptual proposal one of the early competitions we worked on for the national war memorial and i'm just sharing this uh, because to me uh, uh this this project comes very close to what i believe um our work can do that was the context as as you are now <laughs> very well aware that's the central vista uh the the project under a lot of criticism and debate at this point and the site given to everyone this was an open competition was this uh, around the india gate especially these two petals of the six petals and our 
intervention basically uses this one small petal. And it's a part of this historic fabric. Um, so in a way, we wanted to build something which is monumental because it was a national war memorial. And uh, uh, the gesture of martyrdom we believed is monumental, but we also wanted it to be quiet and not impose its presence on the surroundings. So we decided to build something or not build or in a way excavate and go below the surface. Uh, so that's the section, the India Gate, the uh, Param, so the uh, Amar Jawan uh, Jyoti, that's, that's where the, uh, the immortal sol soldier's flame is. And, and this is our intervention. Something like this, you know, as as you and the, also also the idea that it it was a contemplative place for so for us it was important that as you recede into the place you get kind of disconnected with the humdrum and the distractions of the context, and at the very heart of it we imagine these walls, which are made from rammed earth, you know, and we imagine that these earths will come from across India, uh, from every place from where the soldiers come uh, for our uh, in to serve in our armies and our navies and air forces. And as you recede, you get closer and closer to these walls, which then protect the flame, the perpetual flame. So that was, uh, these are some of the drawings that we made at that time. And, and this is the sense of, I mean, it's a visualization roughly done, but this is the sense of what we wanted to achieve, you know, that connection to the sky and the earth and to kind of go closer to the sanctum of the earth per se. So when we talk about the essential idea, I mean, this for this, uh, it was very simple. It, it We wanted something, uh, we wanted the expression to be close to the earth and we wanted it to also be monumental. With So, so in a way, while we were articulating the thoughts on the project, the project itself started to emerge in. The idea of context as an underlay is very important to us. Uh, we um, do not, uh, we are not analytical many times when we do our work. Uh, the time we spend in analysis of context and, and by context, I don't simply mean the physical context. I mean, many other aspects, you know, the aspirations of the users and the clients who approach us, the budgets of the building, the skill that is available in the place where, which, where we are building the the kind of uh, uh, you know neighborhood it is, what it will do to the ecology of the place. The context is in India, especially when you talk about context, it, it has many, many layers and dimensions. And one of the things that we I, I want to do, and sometimes I it's not explicit and it's not really like a document, um, is to understand this context and use it intuitively as an underlay for our work. And there was this uh, wonderful little, so we have, uh, for for a for one of our clients who run a beautiful non-governmental organization, a non-profit uh, organization in Sivan, in the heart of Bihar, um, we have done a couple of small projects for them, and this one was they, they discovered this very old well, and it was an unusual well, you know, different from the other wells, especially because of this this uh, you can see this vertical and this horizontal, this almost like patchwork quilt brick that formed the well. And uh, we, uh, when we studied it more deeply, I mean, uh, and we, we asked a couple of questions to people around, they said that these big bricks are what they call Lahori bricks. It's not that the bricks come from Lahore. It's the, it's the, it's the template of the mold of the brick, which is a Lahori mold. And it's very unique. They do, we, we don't make them anymore. And as we excavated, uh, and this, this well was abundant, nobody used it. And our clients, um, their family had built this well about 150 years ago. So they wanted us to see if we can do something and we can make, make the well more. Uh, so one of the in, in initial things that we did in the process is, uh, of course we drew the well and a little bit of context, but we realized that we, want, we just don't want to restore the well. We restored, I mean, we cleaned up the well, uh, the, we, we work with some people who know how to how to reach the spring from which the water comes. So they did reach the spring and the fresh water started trickling in and uh, the well was recharged and cleaned. Uh, but we also wanted to create a small public place around the well to signify that little moment in history 
uh, that this well is. So what we did was we worked with masons, with people from uh, the village who understood brick much more than we did as architects. So we, we initially, we just strengthened the old walls of the well and we wanted to retain all the bricks that we found. And some of them were actually, you can see across the street, they were stacked there as they, you know, as they were cleaned up and put. So they were all put back and we reached a level where the well was sort of finished. But then we added some more layers around the well uh, to fortify it in some way and also to create this very small and very, you know, like in the scale of the village, uh, a small place for the public. And you can see that there are two, there are about four different kinds of bricks in this this little thing. There's these old Lahore bricks. There are the 130 year old wire cut, or sorry, clay clay molded, hand molded bricks as well in the well. Then of course there are these looks which are, uh, I mean Bihar that region is entirely a brick belt, a lot of kilns. So these these come from immediate context and little far we also found this these kind of more fancy, you know, wire cut bricks and, and uh, these people who came the well, the masons and uh, the, the Raj Masons and the master masons, they said, you know, we'll do borders with these and because, you know, if they will last, they will not chip. So we said, fine, you know, let's do that. And that's how it came out. And I'm, I'm really, I mean, this is one of the projects that we are really um, very fond of because it, uh, of course it went from this to this, but it also translates into this very small, very, let's say urban, you know, in some sense, uh, a small place for the village. Uh, in the evenings, uh, we put we put uh, our clients, they agreed that we can put a solar lamp here that turns off and turns on every day, every evening for about six to seven hours. And the whole village gathers around, um, you know, and they, they, they kind of sit and children play. And it's nice, uh, we vis I visited it after almost, um, two years since we built it. And I realized that it's still the same, you know, and, and there's a lot of rubbish around. I mean, it's it's a village, so it it, it is not completely like, it's not very clean and very tidy. I mean, it has its own sort of rough edges, but somehow without any maintenance of any kind, this particular place was found very clean. So that, that was the small reward. Um, Discourse as a practice, uh, this, uh, as you know, we engage in a lot of um, creation of content. Uh, Inside is our journal, and uh, one of the uh, one of the things that we wanted to do, I mean, when we um, left uh, the magazine, and is to locate ourselves between. We came from a very commercial magazine, and we realized that that's really not for us. You know, we don't want to found that other. Uh, such magazine. Uh, we also did not want to do something very academic we, because we are in the professional space and the academic space has its own journals and its own rigor and its own narrative and the people who write for that and, and that, that has its own ethos. But we wanted to build a professional journal uh, and we wanted to build a professional discourse on architecture and design in India uh, through our practice. And we could we realized that we could we can do probably that is the one thing that we can do through practice is to is to create a professional course on architecture and design in India and and inside became one such attempt. Um, in the process, we have also been engaged with um, in, in you know sometimes revival, sometimes curatorially with uh, some of these uh, smaller exhibitions. This is this one is uh, with Nandita Korea and Kaivan Mehta was the, uh, the unbuilt works of Charles Korea and Ratan Bartlibar designed the exhibition. It was very beautiful. It was very small. And it talked about Korea's uh, unrealized or unbuilt projects, let's not say unrealized. And it had this, and what was nice is that it, it had these tables. So you could sit and you could review these portfolios and, uh, and, uh, uh, you can you could basically uh, engage with the, his ideas more than his built and finished works, which are more popular. Uh, and we realized that um, uh, as we were going through, especially uh, after this exhibition, and 
and there was another event you know there was the demolition of the hall of nations building and we thought that our role uh, is becoming more and more urgent i mean not not in a way that we want to uh, be activists i personally don't have a temperament uh, for something like that uh, but but to be not to be an activist practice but to be more of a proactive practice to put this content out there so we started documenting in some form the the modern heritage or the buildings that belong to modern heritage in india starting from the golconda we i mean tentatively putting bookends to this whole exercise between the golconda and the hussein doshi gufa as it was originally known so year by year we just simply started making a list of all the buildings that presently also most of them don't come under the prerogative of the um the heritage buildings act and and therefore they are not considered they, they out, fall outside the 60 year window which is necessary for any building to be termed heritage so they are and and concrete in in 60 years uh ages much faster than stone or lime so we uh, may end up in it, our, our sense was that we may end up losing a lot of these it was a it was a very quick but a very sort of rigorous exercise of looking at or looking for these structures some of them very illustrious and very known the gold corn the uh, uh, you know the the uh, the building for the um, habib rahman's the gandhi ghat building and all and some of them less known and um, as a practice we we also feel that um, you know we learn from our elders so we are constantly um eng talking to people who whose work and whose ideas we respect and as an extension to our own search for their uh, this this conversation this discourse we our platforms like think matter and all become ext- in, in a way extensions so that we can put this content out there uh, slowly slowly we started in a very amateurish way slowly Uh, we have built it into a little you know every year we kind of refine it a little but i i like also the fact that it is rough around the edges and it's done in that kind of intent you know this long drawling interviews and all and unedited stuff and i i am quite fond of that kind of idea of content as well this is doshi and curtis and we used to drop a lot of these conversations very silently when they happen and uh, somehow they become also uh, a lot of positive feedback for our own practice um both me and mansi independently and through the practice have worked on books uh, editorial projects uh, brinda somaya's book uh, monograph is one such book we have also we we do a lot of talks and this one is called takshila lecture for architecture and society this was the first one at the ngma in bombay <clears throat> and what what we enjoy is not not really only the content we create it is also you know everything that happens on the periphery the conversations and the and the discussions and in the the gestures and you know the movements around the idea that we can talk about architecture in this serious rigorous way of course outside of the academic space and within the professional space of uh, architectural practice in india mm. when we do these books and we curate uh, the, the place in the shade uh, collection of korea's essays uh, of course we do have no editorial or uh, we we were not the authors of this book but uh, uh, very fortunately for the charles korea foundation we designed the book uh, for its reprint and in the process what we realized was that korea uh, each page had a different amount of text so there were, it wasn't like a flow um, that you took the text and put it on paper you know every page had the precise number of words uh, three paragraphs here four and a half somewhere and each page also the text was somehow incredibly well woven with the images very few images that korea had used to illustrate his ideas so when we started we thought oh it's a monochrome book and we can just lay it out and uh, done be done with it but then we realized as we went deeper how di- difficult it is to um uh, design a book like this 
and after a lot of attempt we we kind of i i i'm also this is one of the projects because because of the process of designing this book i i kind of read this about four to five times back and forth and um, one of the one of the things that happens by in editorial projects and in curatorial projects is that through repetition and by repeatedly seeing something you automatically or intuitively start absorbing some of that content it is not the same as reading a textbook and it's a very different process to me that process is very important it's it and i i feel that it only comes to repetition you know it's somehow at least to me it only comes to repetition so the stuff we put up on think matter the videos we edit you know everybody in the office i think is also engaged in a very um, cyclic process of editing re-editing putting it again together you know dealing with our uh, uh, let's say uh, difficult edits uh, time and again color corrections here and there but in that process i think this knowledge somehow becomes internal uh, i hope to some of the people who work with us also for us and that is one of the core uh, motivations of continue to, to uh, publish uh, works and ideas on think matter Uh, conferences uh, again for us they are tools not only to create meaningful public discourse but also to learn ourselves and frame is one such uh, i i i i i think some of you were uh, had attended the conference and what we are engaged now uh, uh, is in creating this repository of drawings an archive of drawings it's called folio um and every week some drawings are published on it uh, it's a uh, and right now i mean the 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 project does not have any clear agenda of why we are doing this we just felt that um, the representation or the 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 techniques of representation have gone way beyond a two dimensional drawing that we are all so familiar with and i felt always that and we we felt that this is um Uh, some day somebody will look at this and uh, make their own connections the merit list uh, is a national uh, conversation on projects and uh, it it was it was designed as a reaction to the kind of awards and all that we used to see uh, architect of the year and stuff so we thought we should if we have to have a genuine conversation if we have to celebrate projects then we must do it in a in with a kind of rigor that it demands so so therefore the merit list now in its fourth cycle and inside i, I have spoken about it uh, and and it is also partly because of our love for print you know both me and mansi come from the um from the legacy or the we have print in our blood in some sense because we ran a magazine we thought we have to do something in print because the the staticness and the tactility of paper does cannot the screen cannot simply replace it or the experience of the auditorium cannot be replaced by a zoom lecture the one that i am presenting or the fact that you can meet and discuss or you can touch something and feel it closely our work is very processed um i don't believe uh, we have any genius or i don't believe in genius or a, i let's say i don't believe uh, in a paper napkin sketch architecture kind of i feel that at least to me and to our practice uh, a lot of good projects happen only through repetition and that repetition or that rigorous process is what we have to kind of continuously indulge in for this one small house we made this 24 different ways of figure ground options and each of them was sort of imagined into quite some detail um the process of drawing and redrawing is also very important
we do a lot of these. Um, this was a small house we are doing in Goa. And for us, this, this whole iterative process or very reflective process of going back and forth, repeatedly drawing is, is the only way we can do architecture, I feel. Is another small house. And I like doing houses, uh, especially small houses. You know, somehow we have um, never been able to successfully do big houses um, because I think there's, uh, the aspirations are very different. But small houses is something that I, I really enjoy because they they kind of in this very small in the, in this very tight space pose this challenge of you know not just uh, functionally working it out but also to to kind of embed the the quality of or the aspirational quality of space that we all and then this is this is one such house in Nasagao that's that's how it looks that's how it is. Systems thinking, um, uh, as matter, one, one of the important uh, ideas that I want to con keep, keep consciously in mind is this ability to think in systems. And by system th thinking, I mean that ideas can move fluidly between scales and typologies, irrespective of whether you're working for a private house, for a, a rich person, or for, in this case, affordable housing for rural, in a rural context. This was a competition entry titled Tetris because our uh, land forms were designed like that. And we were actually trying to design a system uh, for a context, which is like this, you know, on the left-hand side, uh, a typical rural Indian context where everything is kind of under in transition, you know, rough around the edges in construction. You can see building material lying here and there, a cow in the courtyard, you know, uh, the, the, the way the, the, the poor build is not the same way the rich build. Uh, we imagine buildings as finished pieces of work. Uh, the poor don't. It's always in transition. They, they, it always keeps changing. We wanted to create something very malleable and something that people can change as housing. Sorry, I think something went off. Sorry, I'll do it again. It's an important video.
Uh, so, um, uh, very recently in a project uh, for um, a, a sort of a development uh, in one of these kind of hills in Goa, we, uh, in, in principle, are uh, revisiting this idea of incremental or modulus kind of development. Um, it's in a context like this, this is a typical Goan village. Uh, and look at this site, you know, it's, it's completely forested. So anything we do on it is going to be highly violent and very intrusive. So our attempt is to do it in a way that uh, uh, in some, some form preserves the ecology or the ethos of the site. And in housing, what we have come to believe or realize is that it only works if it's plural and multiple uh, and it involves uh, different unit sizes, different kind of people, the young, the old, the rich, the not so rich, the, uh, you know, the, the people who are, uh, who are privileged and not so privileged. And um, then only a housing can thrive and it can only happen. We, I'm, I'm very suspicious of monolithic housing. Um, so in this particular model, we are trying to propose something which has studios, two beds, three beds, four beds in this kind of an interlocking modular system. Um, and of course, dealing with the water and the ecology. In Goa, water, you have to deal with water and you have to deal with the found ecology of the site. It's, an, it's a beautiful, it's a rich and very wooded site. And it has all these wonderful trees and this is a part of our continuing research on uh, how to do any kind of architecture on a site like this. And that's how, how many trees are on the site, you know, I mean, where do you place a building? It's a big question. And we, we kind of are trying to do, see if we can build in a very, in a way that is least intrusive in the way that we can create not more than 20% density on the site and preserve most of this wilderness that exists on the site. And to take advantage of this beautiful terrace slope that we have and to, to build something that also is respectful for what is around in the village. And um, I'm, I'm not trying to mimic uh, the, the language of the built fabric around, but, but to have a contemporary voice, but also to do it in a way that it does not completely feel alien. And uh, you know, like, like a lot of gated communities are. Um, and uh, while we think of projects, we think of, uh, we, we, I believe that we must think of its purpose and not simply think of functionally what their obligations are. And this was a very interesting site. This was this very awkward site made by land consolidated over time uh, on either side of this kind of street on which we are approached to do, make space or uh, make a place for uh, a market, uh, a vegetable and meat market that sits every Wednesdays and Saturdays. And that's, that's, the, that's the highway. And it, the site is on either side of the highway, this very odd shaped, because this was the last chunk after they cut all these fields and they have different ownerships and all. And, and that's the kind of context we were dealing with, you know, um, the beautiful, uh, mustard fields and very picturesque and and when we had we had very low budgets for this so we our challenge is to devise a roofing system that can be um, built at a very low cost and by a local fabricator but also uh, i mean we, what we devised is through the space frames this was like a lot of things that some some people like unarshala do is to use those reinforcement bars and to build it in a cost that's less than the cost of reinforcement uh, if we had to do it in concrete. And, and that this is just one of the wonderful drawings made by uh, our colleague. And um, this shows not only the, uh, one of the initial conceptual drawings that shows the chaos of what a market is. Uh, these, um, it, it's under construction. These are the, uh, this, this was about a month back and the plinths are up and you can see how the space frame was kind of simple, uh, doing simple welds and all. So a lot of our work effort is also to, uh, I mean, these are the kind of projects we truly enjoy. I mean, ones that, that, are, that, that, are, that have great constraints. And I think constraints is what, the, the, the more the constraints, the more enriched 
the design processes. These are from about two weeks back. And we, we wanted to create this kind of semi-transparent barrier so that the market is has a sense of enclosure, but it is not cut off from this wonderful context. And we left some paths for the village people to go across because there's of course houses and fields at the back. Also buildings like this, you know, there's a temple at the back. So somehow you, we wanted to maintain that connection with the temple. These are from yesterday, these photographs. Uh, and this, this wonderful, this incredible uh, banyan tree, which has survived the whole process of construction from the very beginning that was kind of imagined as the focal point of this market. And then everything is organized simply around. And what happens in India is this, you know, um, we, um, so, so these were photos sent to us last week and we have yet, no, we are not, we have not completely ended over the project yet. We have not finished constructing it. We have to still do a lot of stuff. We have to finish the floor. We have to finish this pave, paving in this sort of muddy, uh, what may, you know, uh, earthy areas, the in-between spaces. But the market has to work, you know, because these people, for, they depend on this particular market for their livelihoods and we can't really. So it is it is functioning. So the two days that, so the two days of the week, the construction stops and the market continues to operate and the balance days, they continue to construct. And this is what it looks like now. Of course, we have a lot of work to do still, but we have to do when these people are not there, uh, the remaining six days. No, say remaining five days. And that's how it is on the both side of the street. You can see the temple at the back. Yeah, this, this, he's not part of our team, but it, it's very interesting that, that he's taking photos because for him, uh, after a long time, this market is relocated here and it's new. It used to happen at the same site for many years. For some time it was relocated because we were doing this project, but now he, he's one of the, probably one of the people who are selling or buying, but it's interesting how they document something new in the environment and, and the phones are of course omnipresent. And we want to recognize uh, the th in through our practice, this uh, idea of finding beauty in the ordinary. And we always look at these magazines and this very uh, strange utopian lifestyle images, which everything seems you know, out of reach and some somehow completely, and, and especially after the pandemic, completely incoherent with the reality around. And, and therefore our work, we don't want to use anything special. We, we try to work with things that we find in the context, the skill that is readily available. And in India, that's almost everywhere. Um, uh, this small, wonderful book that my, uh, when I was interning with Dharmesh uh, in Auroville, he gifted me uh, and it, it continues, sometimes I refer to it, it continues to uh, influence the way I think about uh, the architecture of India, you know, the messy, the un, unresolved way. Some of the last few projects I want to share before we close, uh, this one is, is a very personal favorite. There was a very old shrine. Uh, and, and the good thing about this shrine uh, was that it, uh, unlike a lot of shrines which have, which um, relate or which, which are religious. I mean, this is also a religious place, but it is not, it is more of a sacred place, but it is not connected to a religion per se, you know? So it's like one of those, uh, like the Ajme Darga, you know, where people from all religions and backgrounds go. While of course it is an Islamic shrine. So it, this was a place like that. And one of one of the things that are, uh, the brief to us was that there was a school, what, what is right now written as school. It was an, it's an Anganwadi right next to it. And, um, the, the people who um, uh, are from this village, they wanted this shrine to be just, just have a roof and a little bit of enclosure because it was exposed to the elements and in monsoon, it becomes very difficult to. So we also realized that people from all backgrounds, from different castes and all, they come here. It's, so it's not really a Hindu shrine or a, or a Islamic shrine. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a secular place. So we wanted to find an architecture which does not, uh, 
have any iconography or symbolic connections to religion. And in the process also, uh, uh, you know, we also realized that this little platform we should create connecting these, again, it's a village. There are all these different kinds of buildings. We wanted to have, you know, make a little coherent space and a little small public place for people to gather. Very simple construction. Again, brick and form finished concrete. Uh, and, and that's how it sits in its context. The, the plinth is the original plinth of the uh, shrine. We just extended it a little bit to make it like sort of just regularize it as a square. And we added this little plaza or a little thing in the front and connected it with the Anganwadi. So the, the part of the budget was also to paint and renovate to a certain degree the Anganwadi structure so that it also people who come here, the kids who come here for from six to 12 also feel, and they can also feel, uh, and it also becomes a nice place for the Anganwadi, for the children who come to the Anganwadi to play around and all. Also animals, you know, who are, they are all, always there if you are working in the village. And this is completely, there's no, I mean, these are masons from the place. We have, very, we issued very few drawings just to, uh, just to give them a sense of scale and stuff like that. And the entire skill came from them. And the whole resolution of this corner, the beautiful de detail in this, uh, where the shell, the concrete shell meets uh, the brick, it's all resolved by them. We have very little input. And th therefore we, we, in India, when we work, I mean, we, we are constantly engaged with this idea of making. And unlike practicing in the West or in the first world uh, per se, when, you, uh, when if you have to make something, it has to be made in this hermet hermetically sealed, you know, exclusive environments in India, making is so simple, you know, fabrication is a skill that's omnipresent in villages, in cities, um, carpentry, uh, masonry, these are, you know, urban skills, these are rural skills, these are um, easily available, very, very affordable, 90% of our architecture still is built by people, artisans, and what, what we, today morning, we're talking about this whole idea of labor, you know, and how the idea of labor in India is so skewed because these people are actually highly skilled and can do so much. Um, so this idea of making is very, very, um, sometimes our building has a certain degree of sophistication, but we always realize that they are put together by people and by effort, human effort. Um, and uh, uh, this is one of the sm one small sort of learning center we are engaged with. And this old house, had, we got a second life as this center. And our, our language is very contemporary. I mean, in some sense, very industrial. Because this is a place where students will come and it's like a maker space. They will do their projects here and stuff. But um, we are consciously aware, constantly aware of people who, who put buildings like this together, you know, and, and they are somehow they are, they, they, uh, we have to be aware and we have to respect the, the embedded knowledge, the tacit knowledge that we access through people like that. And that is a very important input into our practice. We rely heavily on them. We don't over detail our buildings sometimes. We, we, and sometimes we also detail uh, the way, uh, you know, our connection with the contractor, with the carpenter, the way. So we do talk a lot to these people and we, we try to gain from their uh, tacit knowledge. We have been doing this with people who make IPS, oxide flows. This incredible team from Tamil Nadu can, you know, does this. And this is a completely handmade floor. So it's, a, it's such a joy of seeing men at work. Or people like him who are uh, like master masons, he's, uh, he's explaining here to me how to put those bricks over bricks and how to match those um, those uh, holes in a way that small bars of reinforcement can go through and then can, we can create that screen. And he has actually worked on all three of those sites that we sh I showed you, the well, the shrine and the market. And I think I, I'll continue to, we'll, we'll try and continue to work with him in the future. These are portraits of different workers from one of our sites. Uh, 
and if you see them you can't make out you know they come from this different places in india in the same uh, in the same sort of set of images you uh, there are people from jharkhand there 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 are there's one person from bihar from up there are local goans here there are there is one christian man three hindu men or and and, and muslim men in this image and you can't really tell one from the other and this is what building sites are you know they are truly secular places and they they the there where these uh, wonderful people come together and um to to try and uh, and so and therefore when i started i wanted to say that i when we present this work we present on behalf of everyone it's not really and I, we don't intend it to be uh, a practice which is then led by a single personality or an idea uh and their input into our practice is very essential and that th therefore this idea of making for us is very compelling um that is the context we are in and as you can see it's not uh, you know we, it's not like a single metro it's it's kind of this en enormous network of urban peri urban rural uh, suburban sort of tier 3 uh, tier 4 villages Uh, agrarian uh, industrial towns and and look at that i mean that's the kind of uh, you know context we are dealing with it's an it's a continuous density flux across this enormous land and um, and we we have to be i mean we feel that we have to be consciously aware of that context in our work the three um, ideas of india that are Uh, at least to me very important in our practice the idea of uh, gandhi's india the idea of nehru's india and the idea of tagore's india um and we have been fortunate to have read and visited buildings and places which are linked to these three gentlemen and and to see that how different their ideas of india were and how all three of them are relevant and 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 hold true because um we are after all a pluralistic um landscape we are a landscape of great diversity and uh, it is it is unfortunate that we have you know started to see our many many shades of uh, colors as as blacks and whites now and and, and that's uh, that is something that we want to in principle resist and and even you know uh, uh react to strongly through our work uh, uh this is uh, uh about two years back uh or uh, everybody who had worked with us and our team at that point we had got together for this um conference that we were doing and like i said a practice is not uh, it can be for a time driven by an individual but it cannot really continue to be enriched by the ideas and of of one person or only a set of people it has to evolve and as we grow or as we kind of go year by year more and more people keep adding to this kind of uh, you know, this team and which which is what the practice is thank you thank you thank you rituraj uh, i hope uh, you can hear me yes yes yeah thank you so much for uh, taking us through such uh, interesting and incredible projects and such diverse kind of um, you know portfolio of things that you have been doing at matter it's really fascinating to see that uh, you know uh, uh, a practice like such can really kind of uh, Uh, exist meaningfully today and when i was looking through your works i was kind of thinking that in some sense you know uh, korea charles korea uh, whom uh, whose uh, whose practice i think uh, has deeply kind of uh, um, influenced uh, and informed your own was also the, the seeds of this multi pronged kind of dimensions of design architecture were laid in korea's own practice when you know i mean we can see that he was such a silent not just an architect but a silent curator publisher theorist planner educationist builder and at the end an archivist too 
so and 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 i think uh, you know uh, in some sense the matter also kind of brings a new uh, avatar of that practiced in its multi uh, faceted and multi people kind of uh, you know uh, team which and giving face to all of them which is very interesting and i thought the three ideas which uh, i want to highlight uh, over that i gathered over your talk is one is that um, uh, which addressed a, the idea of uh, agency uh, in the talk were uh, you know uh, uh, the idea of achieving um, um, achieving through different scales uh, the idea of uh, of space and uh, intervening and thinking about things uh and which is also in some sense very uh, multi pronged and multi dimensional not just limiting to uh thinking about uh, uh you know the built but also the unbuilt uh, uh so uh, in that sense uh, kind of uh, thinking about content content uh to design books and buildings and uh, the second idea that i thought in that direction was uh the fact that you indirectly um uh, kind of hinted at discourse as celebration you know uh, and i i i would like to kind of uh, take that further eventually and the third idea which i want to open up with you which i thought uh, could frame your practice is opening up an idea in the, in the realm of agency i mean opening opening up this idea of a new neo frugal aesthetic uh, which is uh, which is you know uh, uh, it's not uh, it's not the frugal of korea but it's kind of taking it a bit further and uh, uh engaging with the forces that we have uh today so so in that line of thought the first uh, uh first question uh that i kind of was thinking uh to ask you uh, because you also started uh, um as a discourse practice that what do you think is the instrumentality of discourse today in india and and uh, that i would like you to kind of address in the context of how you position yourself between the commercial and the uh, and the academic uh, what i want to kind of uh, you know um, understand from you is what does it mean to talk to the professional uh, today uh, in uh, you know uh, in terms of discourse so if you can kind of uh, put some light on how do, how did you imagine matter as a as a platform to discuss with professionals what values did you want to want to engage professionals uh, in in your uh, in your efforts i think mansi mansi you can uh, take this question and then i will of course follow sure. and react yeah um so thank you anuj um i think that to answer your question when we are thinking of a professional space one of the key ideas when we were working with the magazine and when we say commercial in that sense that a we are talking about talking to architects about their projects which is mostly about profiling and uh, one of the terms that i think to start i will address is you know when people start talking about architectural journalism it's not something that we agree with like journalism as a term is not something that we agree with at all and you know when people started writing to us that you know i'm very interested in writing i'm very yeah. interested in journalism that sort of takes away from the whole idea of what we were trying to do mm. and so what we were trying to do is essentially discuss projects mm. projects the intent of the projects the purpose the ambition that the architects were setting for it Mm. and we were trying to look at ideas and that's where you know this whole space started from that when we meant that we are speaking to professionals we are talking about the making of a building or the visualizing of the space or how they are talking about representing uh, representing it or how they are try trying to set the ambition for the project what is it that they are trying to do uh what are the possibilities they're trying to enforce what is the potential they're trying to look at and we don't mean it in the sense of just the site or just the yeah. building yeah. and that space we found um and i should not say that you know it's a space that's not been explored and now a media space could be anything there are no boundaries anymore social media is a thing institutions are leading discourse uh, the way ce is doing right now with conversations with professionals with practice everybody starting to question practice yeah uh, they are starting to question projects the making of it you know what is what is the idea behind it mm. 
before um, it seemed to be that they're just profiling the project and mm -hmm. that's something that we were trying to deviate from as matter and we were not trying to theorize we yeah. were not trying to um, archive it in the truly documentation sort of a sense we were just trying to lend a perspective and i think that's what our effort at matter has been right yeah. so in in your uh, kind of if i may say in your survey of uh, you know these projects what do you think are the key questions um, and intents and ambitions that lay in uh, in uh, architects projects today across uh, india mm. no one of the uh, i mean um, uh, uh, you know taking from what manzi uh, articulated and uh, you see when we uh, established matter um, we were Anuraj, on... could you hold the mic yeah sorry. sorry yeah yeah taking from what manzi said i i think when we established matter um, we were sensing that the boom you know the 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 slow you know the, the the after the economy opened up in the 1990s there was this period of this crazy uh, lifestyle ambitious uh, you know a lot of new practices set up uh, catering to this new rich new rich um, you know a lot of second homes being built in alibagh and in goa the whole landscape of uh, reporting on architecture talking on architecture Uh, majority of magazines and all started reporting incredibly fancy high spec buildings mm -hmm. uh, which somehow had had a shelf life of its own you know and uh, when we were at the magazine initially we were we were also very fascinated by these that this that kind of architecture that kind of work and as we started to you know as we started to work in our own practice and you know foundation our exposure of course like you said with korea we started to question that as the you know the the model of practice mm. and that had many many issues you know one it was highly consumptive uh, extremely indulgent um, completely this this um, connected from the context or the yeah. people of our land you know i mean it has no and it, and, and i'm not going to say that we don't build for the rich it's not a good i mean that's not what we i mean we of course have clients who are rich and who have ambitious and aspirational projects who, which come mm -hmm. to us but our effort is to slowly move away from that narrative mm -hmm. which which is of um which uh, basically is this sort of aspirational lifestyle journalism yeah. reporting yeah. the 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 consumer media around architecture so one of the things that we wanted to do initially as matter and when we set up uh, the frame conclave or the merit list was to move away or to try and steer this conversation the way we talk to professionals away from that kind of narrative and and that became our motivation for the initial years and continues to be you know the kind of people we talk to and the kind of work we put, and we also decided at some point not to for a certain period of time at all feature projects on matter so for a long time on our platform we could never see projects you know we always we always talked about practice talked about processes drawings model making we talked about building materials stuff like that so we our our effort was also <clears throat> uh when you say talk to the professional our effort was to also try and find people who were also trying to look for a model of practice that was not completely designed or built on that post liberalization capital boom you know and to and and that we all knew was not going to last and especially if you see what has happened in the last one and a half years you cannot continue to justify building 404000 square feet single family homes anymore i mean it's bizarre i mean and it's not that those projects are not there you know the rich have uh, not stopped getting richer in the last one and a half years but we can see the the clearly the the, the problems in our, uh, the 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 fault lines in our society so so to build a practice on that kind of a, an idea is not our thing uh, yeah. i mean it's not something and we we realize that it's not just i mean in the academic space also Mm -hmm. you would know and you 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 can also share your views on this 
we found that the kind of projects that were students were dealing with has changed fundamentally in the last five six years mm -hmm. they are no longer uh, you know um, museums and uh, airports uh, i mean the, uh, you see less and less museums and airports. museums yeah. fortunately are still around i mean airports have yeah. completely gone yeah so so in some sense the typology uh, uh, and you can see as you go to reviews in, in the academic space and uh, in when you look at final year projects and all you can see more and more students want to engage with this messy urban realities uh, yeah. and that is also somehow changing in practice mm. i feel uh, like if you if you uh, if you see a lot of uh, faculty visiting faculty at your school for example their work they they don't um, <clears throat> they have modeled that practice in this post liberal you know post consumer kind of mm. way and that to us is where what the kind of work that we want to talk about through matter right right um before i go on to my next questions i would urge the audience to drop their questions in the question and answer box which you will see and we'll take them right after uh, you know our short conversation uh, and uh, proceeding to you know my follow up kind of question that i feel that the merit list is also a space which is your own personal portfolio of projects which you take inspiration from uh, and uh, you take you draw a lot from and so i wanted to understand that what um uh, like first is uh, that how do you um uh, kind of uh, think of merit in the merit list uh, what what is your uh, way of filtering projects for the merit list and i also kind of in an allied way uh, want to open up that how do we uh, produce value for frugality which is linked to both your documentation of projects as well as uh, uh, you know uh, tendencies we see in your practice um so so it will be nice to kind of understand how do you articulate the framework for selecting projects for the merit list Uh, any, yeah, any yeah sure yeah. i i uh, mansi you want to go i mean no you can take it i mean <laughs> no one, one of the things uh, to understand is that we um, we established the merit list as a reaction to what we saw as being awarded as good architecture in india and the majority of this uh, awards barring a very few um, um were dealing with this kind of celebrating the we felt the wrong kind of work and the right kind of work was not even featured there because the people who do this right kind of work or that we think in our practice as right kind of work uh, did not have i think uh, appropriate is the word <laughs> not right no no but uh, you can always say wrong and right you yeah, know okay. i mean uh, it's i'm i'm just saying that it can always be um, uh, black and white in that sense so now you have to take sides uh, side times so uh, we uh, we uh, so we we are the see we are the conveners of the merit list so we don't have any uh, opinion in selecting these projects mm -hmm. what we did decide is that one is that we that we were setting up the merit list we said that we will not have a fee we will never charge a fee to register a project mm. so it really opens out for every practice big practices small practices mm. new practices established ones yeah uh, the second is that we will do the whole process focused on projects and do it anonymously mm. so in a way we will um, deviate will move away from the culture of celebrating architects and practices and we will look at i think uh, also i'll interject here that it's open to anyone it need not be an architect it mm. is open to organizations yeah. any collaborator who has worked on it as long as they acknowledge the credit Uh, yeah. the the focus is on the project and not the author right yeah, yeah. we were, i mean we respected so it was a completely anonymous it is a anonymous process right. and we also uh, 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 set up a, a jury standard in a way in in a way that we said the jury must build a consensus around a project it cannot happen by voting mm -hmm. so it cannot simply happen that this project had maximum number of votes so simply it wins so we did not have winners and losers i mean it, it was so therefore it was called the list because we are simply looking at good work that represents the values of practice or building or architecture or 
whatever in india and therefore the the each jury um, has to uh, come to consensus by negotiations by discussions by discourse um to the selection of projects and what happens is that we silently observe and document the whole process so what it does is it actually starts you know the the jury process moves away from simply celebrating good work and it starts articulating concerns yeah. uh, for example carving yeah. the urban block for large civic projects you know yeah. construction you know, innovating in construction eloquent way of dealing with heritage these are simply larger broader concerns that the jury had and the jury did select certain projects not be the best examples but they are the ones if you have to see so in some sense um, we um, you know the 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 merit list um, became for us also and it's it's when you say it's really true we consciously look at the merit list for the kind of work that we want to do as through the practice i think mansi will be able to tell a little more about that that bit and and a little bit about the jury process i think yeah yeah so i think that um, like he said it's an anonymous evaluation um what has happened over the years because uh, the only ones privy to the names are, is that one person in matter it's not even all of us uh, so even if when we are sitting in the room not all of us are aware of which project is by which architect unless it's of course you know very very known and has been published widely um so but that also we encourage not everyone to not say it or you know somewhere let it be just an underlay to the process so that you know the debate is only about the project um also what happens is which we have realized that over the past uh, few years is that people do write in now and ask us but i have an interior project is it eligible for the merit list because right. somehow your projects don't seem to be that and right. uh, we have to go back and tell them that you know if you see the first process cycle there was an interior project chosen yeah. which was a completely uh, different idea where you know the jury debated over what are conditioned i uh, yeah. look at that you know yeah. we have preconceptions as architects Yes. and somehow we sort of you know um, do not entertain a certain kind of a project and yeah. where if they could acknowledge the merit of the semantics of the project and that is why they chose the project right. so the jury is um, goes through three rounds one is that they reflect on their own they look at each project from their own biases mm. and uh, choose a project or not mm. um, all the projects that are chosen whether one has been or all five of the jury members have chosen that project they send it to us we compile that and then each project goes up for discussion and that is put up as a long list um, this time the long list has 187 projects so the six jury members are going to debate 187 projects and the people who um, feel strongly about it um, put up their thoughts and say that you know this is where they feel that that is the merit of the project or that is the idea that they want to so the jury decides the parameters and yeah. uh, they put forth and, and yeah sorry. and just a quick question that the jury is um, um, uh, it's a rotating jury or it is uh, appointed by a uh, uh, matter uh, as a team we invite the jury members we okay. we go uh, there is a Uh, there is a way to also uh, the way we invite we are looking also at gender we are looking at seniority right. we are looking uh, but we have made sure that every jury has someone from um, a non architectural background um, so it's either a, but someone from the field which is peripheral um, yeah. someone who can understand space at the same time does not talk about the architectonics of the building right. so um, like a photographer a filmmaker yeah. a writer um, someone who's been totally disengaged with the architectural discourse so they come in from a very different perspective and right. yeah so that's how the jury is that's that's really really uh, you know nice to hear i mean completely rethinking the approach to awards and uh, uh, you know Uh, that's really appreciative and truly i think it it in some sense opens up the agency uh, and that's where i think it fits in this whole idea of building agency where you know so many projects that did not have space for being published in mainstream media kind of uh, finds a voice and and also redirects in some sense the focus to you know more uh, kind of uh, uh, secular relevant 
kind of uh, projects outside the ambit of a private uh, bubble also you know, i should add that you know we we have deliberately we don't have any incentive to the merit list so you're participating only for the discussion there's no really a winner or uh, right. there's no cash prize to it uh, there's no trophy right. um, so uh, at the most we have that block which is a golden ratio or the merit list block which is given and that's yeah. sort of the whole thing in fact uh, the only thing that we say is that uh, the comments are recorded so anyone and people do write in saying that you know uh, uh, what did the jury say about my project and yeah. we do have the notes sent to them that this is what came right. up and i would in fact also like to extend and uh, uh, like to think of the merit list as a collection of concerns and questions which we can lend further to you know architects who think about uh, you know engaging with space in a meaningful way so i think uh, you know that will be an amazing process to think of this as a list of uh, things that you you might want to uh, uh, you know think when you are designing something and and i want to just kind of uh, drop in one question about your practice uh, and kind of lead us, ourselves into the audience q and a i want to kind of understand that if you are if you're conscious i mean if we look at the trajectory of your own practice you have consciously uh started taking projects which are uh, much more embedded into um uh kind of or rather uh, rather uh, the the set of projects we saw primarily today are uh, uh in some sense working with a very unique frugal uh, aesthetic which i am calling neo frugal because because it's it works with an infrastructural industrial uh, kind of uh, tactility fused with um with uh, you know uh, um in a certain sense a socialist kind of uh, architecture that we study from the 60s and that's and it's interesting that it is also hinged on the point of uh, uh, korea's uh, anganwadi project which was probably one of his last kind of uh, uh, projects so i would like to uh, like you also talk about it that how do you think through these uh, because uh, they seem to be um, driven primarily by economy budget um, and so on or are there other factors which are also kind of um, you know pushing pushing those uh, uh, those points yeah thanks um, 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 well uh, one of the things that i want to clarify is that we do not subscribe to or have a subscribed or a committed aesthetic the the visual language of a project is purely incidental to the process it's purely incidental so it's not um it, we and i i also resist it quite a bit in our practice that i don't want to really get into the trap of trying to work with certain kind of materials or certain kind of spec or um one of the important things that we want to do as a practice and we which we are trying to do on irrespective of the typology the scales the kind of clients that we have the backgrounds from which with they come is that to question what is the appropriate way to approach a project or do the kind of work that uh, uh you know we want to do so somehow um the, in some projects it it leads to a certain kind of an aesthetic and in 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 that as you you can you can kind of call it neo frugal i mean uh, of course it is it is that because it it is these projects are built really at no budgets so anything you propose is over budget you know so because they don't have money they start with a point that we but we don't have money yeah but um what happens in that so high, these are highly negotiated projects yeah. so somehow you as architects are also compelled to be very responsible with where you are spending that resource yeah and that resource is very very important to the people who are putting and it's it's not i mean even a smaller project like that little shrine of the well also ends up costing lakhs so it's not that the, any pro, any architectural project is a high value investment right mm-hmm. with and generally with very low returns yeah. um, you know and or very long term returns so in that sense you have to um really think and and for us also when we observe the things that are happening in to our context and and what what is 
um, our role in that, you know, larger thing, we realize that we have to be a little more conscious about how indulgent our yeah. pro- projects are, how yeah. um, how consumptive they are. Are they um, uh, and any uh, and we have to uh, and even that project that we sh- I, we shared of that uh, development on that hill in Goa, uh, we have to uh, accept the fact that if we want to build, it is going to be extremely violent and intrusive as a process. So one of the important things that we want to do as a practice is to also understand how can we help reconcile. Uh, you know, uh, what is the process of reconciliation after the process of building is done mm. and you exit. So therefore, we love to visit our projects again. I mean, after like, like do a sort of post occupancy. And in India, especially when you work, you realize that many in many cases, if you do institutional work or public buildings or anything that is not a single family residence, your users are not the same as your clients. So the views that you have and the kind of conversation that you have with clients, the people who bring the project to you, yeah. are never going to use that space on a day-to-day basis. So in that sense, your uh, and it pushes us to engage with people from these diverse backgrounds. So and that is something that we have learned in practice that we want and we don't want to really call it an aesthetic, but it's it's it is the outcome of that process in which we want to be very aware of what is appropriate. Yeah. as an architecture, as a response to that program. Mm. Thanks, thanks. That's, uh, yeah, that brings a lot of perspective uh, to, to it, of course. I, I mean, uh, um, of course, it was not to slot it as an aesthetic, but as a, a way of thinking about practice itself. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll now take some questions uh, uh, that have come in our Q&A box. Uh, I, maybe I'll start the other way around and invite Rupali to uh, to uh, bring her question. Uh, Rupali, are you here? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Rudraj and Mansi. I think what is uh, really interesting is these two. You know, I think what you've also articulated in the poster. Uh, this sort of two-pronged approach of the practice, right? Like one that is coming out of um, the forces of life, right? Like you say, the messiness of life and the forces of life on the one hand, um, and the other where you kind of position yourself as this sort of almost this kind of catalytic space, you know, where you are you're talking to others, right? And I like the articulation of the idea of practice uh, because otherwise it's all about projects and, you know, I, I'm a little unsure about how you articulate the idea of profession, you know, profession against what, I mean, I would like to understand. Um, but what is interesting about the idea of a practice is that um, it's a kind of long durée practice, you're asking long questions, um, and, and the projects that you do become moments in that practice, right, which is why it's, it's kind of nice to sort of articulate the idea of practice. So I think with this sort of two-pronged approach that you come with, I'm just wondering what the the next steps um, would be in your sort of process of of thinking and shaping, um, you know, knowledge uh, around architectural practice. Um, Because, I mean, I understand that's very tactical to call it merit list and, you know, because it's kind of um, in some ways fighting against the others which are... (coughs) These super, these awards that come in and say, you know, best, I don't know what, <laughs> best services on the third floor and you know, all kinds of things like that. Um, but what, do, what would it mean to then, you know, shape this kind of thinking, uh, you know, through the curatorial, uh, which, which in some ways steers architectural practice away from this so-called professionalism, which becomes kind of moving from project to project, but, you know, bringing in really sort of bringing in concerns, working with the, with, you know, with, with, with sort of a long duration question that you have, right? So I think you're in a unique position in that sense, you know, on the one hand, working with a practice like that, and the other hand, uh, you know, being in this catalytic, I'm just wondering what your what you yourself think um, your next steps would be in this process? No? Mansi, you take this first. 
Um, thank you, Rupali. So quite a difficult question. Um, I think I'll also address one part when, you know, we say the professional, maybe we are not articulating it right. But what we mean is that we're not looking at uh, pedagogical practices or we are not looking at uh, an academician as a practitioner in that sense. We are not trying to, what we're trying to archive is the practice of making and building in India, the history, the praxis of it, and the visual culture that surrounds it. So we are also looking at, say, photography and things like that as practices, um, uh, just in that kind of a space. Um, to the way forward, actually, I don't think that, you know, we have um, that we can uh, explicitly say that this is the direction. I think that intuitively we are going towards archiving um, in some sense. We are starting to look at um, archiving, what we are doing with folio, the kind of questions we are trying to raise with that. Uh, what we started with modern heritage and has a long way to go. We are looking at other projects like the ethos project that he was, uh, that, you know, it took multiple forms about ideas and how patterns of settlement work in India or what is a code of habitat and starting to um, put together not an archival list, but sort of a sense of markers that have occurred for architecture in India and just put it out in the um, open space. I think that one of the things that we have been continually trying to figure out is how to, um, how to locate some sources for a lot of influences that we look for. It's quite difficult, it's quite um, disparate in terms of how uh, architecture of India has been talked about in the past. It's also uh, located in a certain geographical axis and it has always been. And somehow, you know, to um, then decentralize that discourse into these larger domains. Um, to look at smaller practices, to look at two tier cities, to look at younger practices. One of our recent uh, um, projects is the Praxis project where we are looking at uh, practices uh, which have matured over the past decade, especially maybe five to 10 years. And they're trying to, uh, they still have a position, they have an inquiry, uh, but that they're not really figured out much like us the way forward. And we are going to then investigate their concerns, their inquiries, their influences uh, that, you know, what influences them to think so, or what influences them to position themselves as um, these kind of practices in contemporary architecture in India. Mm -hmm. So I think we are uh, heading towards that. Uh, I'll just let Rutraj take over from here. No, I mean, um, uh, also, you know, to, um, to, um, uh, uh, to extend uh, what Mansi said, uh, one of the things that we realized is that, uh, uh, that Rupali, that the, the traditional mode of practice is sort of at, it's towards its end, you know. So the 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 hero architect, the single large practice, the corporate architecture office, the the uh, the the kind of uh, you know. So the, those those traditional. I mean the, the the traditional even the way the large practice is going to be conceived in the next 10, 15 years is going to be fundamentally different from the. Uh, large practices that we see now and it is not and it, it somehow and it, I'm not saying that um, such practices will not exist I mean you will still need the HCPs and the you know the, the, the uh, I guess the RCOPs of the world but they will cease to be relevant and uh, um, uh, and so what would be relevant then you know so we find that th this kind of search that we are engaged with many and we don't really have answers. If you really ask where it's all going, I, I can't really. Tomorrow also, I can't say how it'll be. So, but but um, uh, our sense is that um, the profession per se of architecture or the 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 practice of architecture will be, has to delimit from the traditional idea of an office space or, or an office practice, you know, and it will it will become a practice in pedagogy in teaching. Mm -hmm. um, Outside of the complete realm of academics, there are many people who are doing wonderful things in, because, you know, again, as a reaction to what is happening in majority of schools, 
people are trying to find new ways of engaging with content with students with pedagogy through workshops uh, you must have seen uh, through through uh, experimental curriculum sort of you know uh, outtakes um, through offering um, wonderful um, um uh, you know um, what do you call um, seminars and and um, uh, related study programs plugins to the curriculum so there are many uh, so one of the one of the uh, new kind of practices could be a uh, uh, a pedagogical practice a, a, a practice which is built independently as a research uh, a, and a thought practice in in teaching then of course there is the curatorial practice which you you are very familiar with and uh, and and that that is also a very important kind of practice that questions the status quo that has a kind of um that creates um with an effort uh, an alternative view of the world you know sometimes it's through commentary through exhibitions through writing through um and that curatorial practice or research practice is also a incredibly valid and very important form of practice that we are going to see many people engage with in the very near future we feel and and uh, and in in all this uh, i think uh, uh, our <clears throat> position is that we want to be professionals yes and and i i i frankly think that you know um, the kind of rigor that it takes to make a building is the kind of rigor that it takes to teach is the kind of rigor that it takes to put together an exhibition probably is the kind of rigor that takes to bring out a journal i'm i'm just saying it it in terms of your engagement with the subject matter or the thought or the content in architecture you can find your any of these Uh, uh and we are personally interested in the idea of building uh, uh and especially in the context of india so and the big question going further is that how do you build what is the kind appropriate architecture for our context and that we somehow want to find through our work and through our conversations and through our discourse and that that is the fundamental driving force i mean it uh, of course we have to sustain so we have to do project many projects that we also have turned down or with it kind of over time we have moved out of which do not conceptually um we don't feel that this is appropriate uh this is an this is an architecture of india you know it, it i mean this is the kind of work where we should do here and 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 therefore that search of what kind of work forms a practice or a portfolio or a valid you know let's say office an architectural office in the future is a big question and if you are looking i mean if you have in the past 20 years built only practices that have built exclusive lifestyle um, monuments to people's ego and aspirations um that practice is dead and that's an irrelevant form of practice now uh and that and and that is the idea from to which as a reaction we are doing our work is that yeah. yeah no i absolutely agree but which is why i'm saying even this idea of the pure academic that you are sort of you know separating the professional from that is also dead as yeah, dead completely right? completely yeah it's yeah, possible completely. to function in that kind of ivory tower so it's also kind of, <laughs> no. you know diffusing it's also kind of space of practice yeah all lines are blurred yeah and i think that it's important to kind of you know feed from each other because otherwise there's there's nowhere to go you know yes. so in that sense there may not be this dichotomy that exists anymore no But, yeah. and, and 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 as a as a as a as a practitioner in pedagogy you may find in a few years yourself being completely disengaged from the traditional framework of the school yeah. then what you yeah, yeah and then then what so in in that sense we we are also wanting to disengage with the traditional framework of the office yeah and and uh, yeah. you know operating somewhere in the peripheries yeah no absolutely i mean i think these uh, we need to sort of blur these boundaries very much we've been talking about this idea of the post institution you know the, idea <laughs> the university is dead you know yeah. so how do you sort of operate from the yeah. you know margins yeah we'll kill all our meaningful institutions in very a very short time yeah they are already dead <laughs> <laughs> okay right. so you know you can go on
Yeah, uh, we have a lot of uh, other uh, uh, more questions. Uh, there's an anonymous attendee who has uh, asked, how do you feel about the huge outrage against the Central Vista project? <laughs> so I don't know if he's uh, asking about, he or she is asking about the Central Vista project in your view and or the outrage against the Vista zone. <laughs> You can choose to kind of yeah. One of the problems of questioning the Central Vista project is that it's being questioned by anonymous attendees. <laughs> <laughs> it it is uh, you see the 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 most uh, um, known uh, voices in our fraternity are completely silent uh, somehow. Mm. The people who claim to be the vanguards or the flag bearers of profession in India said nothing about it. So that is also an indicator of where uh, our collective yeah. conscience as the profession is heading, right? I mean, yeah. and it could never happen in a world where Charles Korea would be practicing yeah. uh, in, or in, in Japan when Zahadid was building that. So in fact, the reaction or the vocal reaction is coming from young people, from yeah. uh, uh, people who are anonymous in, in true sense, who do not have and who are suddenly finding it in them to, to question the project, not from the known and, and uh, see in, in a total of 24 practices, I think bid for the project, right? So we can safely assume that those 24 practices agree with the fundamental approach of doing the Central Vista project, right? Now, whether Bimal got it or not, or whether Bimal is doing it rightly or not is, 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 is a secondary question. So. The outrage against the project is also motivated partly we feel from the politics around the project. Yeah. However, uh, it is a valid outrage and it is very rare and is especially in India, uh, very rare for architects to speak about these things in a, in a responsible public way. And a few um, credible voices uh, like the voice of Prem Chandavakar and all who have lent their efforts to this conversation are actually doing a wonderful service because they are creating a valid counterpoint, uh, counter narrative. Now, yes, of course, the project, whether the project will be built or not, yes, it, it, it's by all likeliness, it's look, it looks like it's going to be built. However, by creating this very strong and permanent arguments against the project, um, and that can only happen through discourse, and then that can only happen through a place where we can freely and with responsibility talk about architecture, uh, it, 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 uh, um, uh, it can create a permanent record or a, a, um, a dissent against the project. And the dissent is very important. And also, you know, because it's also collectively including the public, because when Hall of Nations, it was a selective outrage, which was also limited to the architectural fraternity. But with the Central Vista project, it has opened out and at multiple levels. It's talking about the intervention, it's talking about the environment, it's talking about the politics of it, about the transparency of the process. Mm -hmm. It's talking about, you know, the fees allotted to the project. It, 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 is a, um, it is suddenly a debate in public and it definitely is a valid discussion. Um, uh, there's a question by Sehju Singh, who is, uh, uh, first of all, he, he kind of uh, also compliments saying, uh, amazing, truly thrilled. Thank you so much for your presentation. And he has a question uh, where he's asking about water and sanitation and its recycling. And is it possible to do that better in a village? I think he's indicating whether architecture can play a role. Architects can play yes, a role. Yes, no, it's, it's, um, a, it's a good question. It's actually really, um, um, uh, it, 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 is, uh, uh, it, it is a very urgent problem in all our villages. And we work when we, I, I mean, and as, as our, we are urban people, right? We are born in a city, raised in a city, studied in a city, thought about the city worked our entire world was the city and when we first started projects in Bihar when we I traveled and all I realized that these other questions which are what he, uh, Sergio is raising about uh, sanitation and water and uh, about managing waste is is fundamental I, I have logistically uh, coca-cola which is more places than vaccines so in some sense the 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 waste is omnipresent if you see the lakes are contaminated the water bodies are contaminated 
there is uh, the the for uh, so in places the pesticides have seeped into the water sources and it will take ages to um, you know for them to become uh, you know i mean stop doing harm again so in 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 that sense uh, it is a really urgent question uh, uh, in the kind of context and in, in, even when we were desilting that well we realized what kind of rubbish that was inside that well and it's like a it's it, if you go layer by layer it's, it has a, in in that rubbish is our anthropological history you know? <laughs> like there's a there is a layer of lays uh, uh, packets, packets in it yeah, it's, it's just it's, it's incredible how they have reached all these places and yeah. and, um, and in a way uh, it is very critical that we have more and more role more and more positive and more and more uh, determined role in this um, question of um, uh, resources. It's not just water sanitation waste. It's the question of resources. Uh, we uh, and, and a lot of times we think of India having a population problem, but it is actually a resource allocation problem. We have a very few very rich who have cornered almost every everything. And, and the rest of us are all trying to, you know, find uh, uh, dinner on our table on an everyday basis. So this, this disparity, the, 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 the terrible conditions of the, the, the health problems and the sanitation problems are, are a reflection of this disparity. And somehow um, if we have to fundamentally rethink how consumptive our building practices have become. Uh, yeah. But it is not. I mean, I, I'm. I'm. I just feel this way. It's not. I mean, I'm part of the same hypocrisy. So it's not really. I mean, I'm not. By every time we build a building, it's going to be consumptive. It is going to do its harm. It's not. It's not going to change that. Um, we just hope that as we move on, we'll we'll try and do less and less of it, and we'll try and have more and more. And in a recent project, and we are we are actually creating an ecology report uh, uh, around the project because before we intervene or before we make any kind of architecture on that ground, we want to completely understand what exists on that ground, you know, the topsoil, the biodiversity. And so uh, I'm not, uh, uh, but it is, a, it is a very important question, very pragmatic question, but it is somehow we have left this entire domain of resources, man managing resources to um, you know, engineers whom we look down upon, imagine, I mean, they are the people who do this on an everyday basis and it's without them, we would end up choking on uh, sewage. Um, so uh, it, it is, uh, it has to become in, integral to our practice and our thinking process as designers, I feel. Sure. I'm sorry, I misattributed Sergio's gender as he. Uh, Sejo, she and I completely kind of uh, mixed it up. So I'm, I apologize, Sejo. Uh, I'll move on to the next question uh, by Anirudh Sharan. Uh, he says, uh, uh, hi, thank you for this lovely insight. I had a question regarding the process of work within the office. Is there a separate design slash architecture team and a separate publication team working on the journal and the merit list? How do you balance your time between creating architectural works and reviewing others' works? <laughs> okay, um, thank you, Anirudh. Um, no, we don't have a separate team. We, we are a very small office. Um, uh, we are an office of now around eight people. Uh, everyone works on everything. Everyone uh, is in the chaos of everything. Um, they work in content and architecture both. But I think that that's where, I mean, that's where we began as a premise uh, that Rutra said that this is our interface, the content part or the curatorial practice is our interface with the world. That's where we learn. And it's important that we don't distinguish between two teams and have um, a writer board and vis-a-vis -vis architects. So um, most of them, all of them are architects. And all of them write as well, all of them record as well, do the video editing, all of them work on architectural projects as well. And that's the only way I think that uh, they will be able to and like us interface with uh, both the ideas and also the ideas of making. So um, they do both. Um, 
the second question how do we balance uh, there is no balance so we we learned very early on as rutra says that um, the benchmarks that we set for others work we we will not be able or we would never set for ourselves we will never be able to match that and um, incrementally of course we are trying to mold ourselves with the ideas to the concerns that we start to question in others work we are starting to question in ourselves but fundamentally um, i don't think that that is what we do rutra yeah, yeah. we also know we also early on realized that if we hold ourselves at the beginning to the benchmarks of practice that we our projects or the kind of work that we want to see people do we won't be able to we'll freeze you know we we'll able to develop a practice and uh, um in a very conscious way we uh, we accepted our mediocrity early on and slowly uh, and our idea was that slowly we will increase the benchmark so everybody else can also catch on so we can't see suddenly and we realize it's not possible to do that it's not possible to create good buildings uh, uh, the process of practice is such that you have to create a certain body of reasonably bad work to learn from and then slowly get so only learning by making that we can get to the point of creating a reasonably and by our own standards a reasonably decent practice um we may not still match the kind of standards that the jury of the merit list holds other people to and that is why we ourselves are simply conveners so when we create these platforms um we do not create them with um an idea that we it they will ever use it to propagate our work or we we are simply learning so even if uh, we we have uh, refrained from publishing our work ever uh, even indirectly we have always refrained from commenting people uh, uh, or or trying to uh, steer any conversation in the merit list uh, and when we do conferences like frame we are always in the background so the the re- and and the journal itself we we except from a very small note that we write at the beginning there is absolutely no presence of our our biases in the journal we try i mean of course we have uh, i mean the moment you do a journal there are biases but we try to keep ourselves outside of that uh, immediate uh, universe of us simply because we think that we are we we want to create platforms for people to um have a voice rather than creating platforms for us to have a voice and by diminishing the or by deamplifying our voice from our platforms we are able to make them more accessible people we are able to make people feel more comfortable dealing with us and we are also able to break through that traditional mode of journalism publishing media sort of mold so um in 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 a way it it it's it it is a very conscious choice to keep ourselves in the background and not too much uh, not too much as the 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 curators of everything there are two questions around uh, the uh, you know the initiative of archives uh, through matter by jatan gala and rishab chajar and uh, i am going to combine them into one and uh, just read out jatan's uh, uh, comment it was really interesting to see you uh, your practice being being pulled by processes of archiving editing and of building and interventions in a site and one could see how the learnings of these archives are echoed in your practices my question is is the is the process of archiving Uh, in the process of archiving how do you look at the difference between architecture which is built and space which is made through everyday practices how how does the larger archive of the world hold these everyday practices which shape the idea of space um, well well first of all i mean we are not consciously uh, building an archive uh, the archive is incidental to the um uh, the ideas or platforms like the merit list or uh, or or publishing through matter so we are not an archive we are just a collection of like just have a couple of hard disks filled with content and uh, um we do not also we are not really i mean 
the archiving itself is a very very serious and a very uh, important uh, a work we yet are not really set out to do that so in a small way the content uh, original content that we have created over time is has become a repository of sorts for us and for everybody else in fact all the projects that have been ever shortlisted on the merit list are actually in the public domain so uh, in some sense we um, are a different kind of an archive it, we are a record of these projects it's very simple uh, however we don't have any curatorial means to understand what we have as content yet we do not have an archivist's eye we do not have so maybe sometime in the future maybe like 10 years from now somebody might look at this um, content that has built over time uh, accumulated with us mm. and sees and find something valuable in it and it is a completely up to them we don't um, think that um, um, uh, as on we also are very conscious that uh, as a private domain practice yes finally we are not a non profit we are a we are a office uh, we are a limited liability partnership and we we uh, are a uh, in in the in the legal sense we are uh, a private space so being a private space we don't also want to kind of collect and keep with us all the data so her whole uh, in fact if you go to any of our platforms merit list um, matter uh, folio everything that we receive immediately and in very short time is put out in the public domain mm, and um in that context whatever we are building becomes a part of the larger archive of the world if you have to say that uh, however i i don't have any conscious way of looking at it yet um maybe sometime in the future we will look at this seriously and see what we can what this holds Mansi, you would like to add anything? No, I think as an uh, I don't want to extend on the idea. I, I think that what he's saying is truly that we we have never thought of it as an archive as a practice. We're just looking at uh, the idea of publishing and the idea of um, looking at ideas. You know, it, it's so whatever we receive is also for the purpose of publishing, and it's out there. We have never put a subscription fee ever. Um, we have uh, never actively taken an advertisement. The only people. Um, that we we do seek funding for some of our editorial projects which have a lot of investment and those are explicitly named as partners or whatever sponsorship we receive is mostly towards the production and that's uh, that's um, they are editorial partnerships only in the sense of that um, we also work with them to look at their processes closely so uh, when we are doing these projects i don't think that we are looking at setting up an institutional archive we are also not naming it so even folio says that it's um, collecting or publishing drawings in the digital format we are looking at representation so it's an inquiry based um, list in some sense so i think and we are simply a conduit uh, yeah, let's say uh, even uh, uh, anuj and uh, this to react to both vishav and jatan um we um, our personalities are very rarely in the work that we put out there we are simply asking questions in a very inquisitive way and then the responses we receive is put out there for a lot of people of different from different strata different age groups to engage with so in a, in a way our, con our content does not have a very sophisticated curatorial yeah. agenda we don't have it and uh, um Uh, what we what what what, what uh, like what um, uh, rupali articulated no the catalytic space i think the the idea of being catalysts is important we we just want to kind of bridge that uh, deficit gap you know between the world of academics and from the from where we came and and the world of professional practice uh, somehow there's this in between space we found which is a sort of sweet spot for us and and we are just trying to bridge that space um without any agenda at the moment oh, and and the, the one of the most co core motivators of everything we do is that so that we also get to talk and learn and uh, do so we, it is not we have not yet made money uh, uh, from all these initiatives we of course at some point they became initial they will funded by the professional fees of the office and slowly slowly they 
we found funders supporters for these ideas and now more, more or less everything is self funded a lot of it is also cross subsidized so in in a way we are purely uh, for and for some time we also want to do that we don't want to position ourselves as uh, you know, curators or um um or even a man yeah uh, even a magazine because uh, one of the things that you know shrivatsan once pointed out in context of matter is he said that it's a it's a good um, idea but they don't have frequency and uh, I, I i i was not there but i i learned of it later and i i thought that you know that's a nice way to think of it because i realized that you know uh, we have no obligation to frequencies we are not a magazine um the fact is that sometimes when we don't have money for a long time when it's it's not possible to cross subsidize a manas in terms of content we we the work slows down on uh, the content front it's not possible of course there are some things that are cyclic the merit list is cyclic or uh, the journal is cyclic and there we have actively sought funds but something like think matter or, or folio it's entirely subsidized by us and when that happens obviously the commitments um are proportionate to uh, how uh, how loaded we are in terms of the architecture work or other things that are happening and mm -hmm. but also at the same time it keeps us free of any obligations it keeps us free of this perception also that we are a magazine and hence we should be publishing in a certain way yeah and also i think through this response i'm compelled to think of archive itself as a channel to build agency in some sense and new kinds of agencies uh, opening up new directions to think space in uh, there's one last question uh, again by an anonymous attendee I, uh, so uh, the question reads that hi thank you so much for this presentation it was great uh, so currently in the third year we are studying about our our buildings about how our buildings will respond to our climate and so we are designing our buildings accordingly my question here is you have dealt with various systems of materials and made drawings for them so in the in the coming together of these systems of materials did you make any interventions as such for example combining two different materials together if so could you briefly talk about how you did so or did you have help of local workers probably is uh, he or she is talking about uh, asking about learnings from the field and uh, and how architects engage with the knowledge of the field um uh, when you say climate or when you say field or when you say local workers um uh, they all form a part of the 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 explicit or the implicit context of any project so uh if if you if you have to i mean i i feel that if uh, i have to locate an an architecture unlike um, product design or uh, uh buildings are heavy and rooted in most cases and they do not move around so they cannot change contexts and therefore they have obligations to climate they have obligations to material they have obligations to every skill they they have obligations to to other cultural and social and economic forces of the climate and these these sub layers that we have to read into if we have to sensitively intervene anywhere um and while a lot of these readings are uh, analytical like you can study these things and then draw your conclusions from a lot of these readings are intuitive which you cannot make explicit moves you know and uh, reactions so when for example when you are combining brick with steel you have to depend and lean heavily on some knowledge that you can find in that context um uh, because you as an architect of course you presume that you can create this knowledge overnight by drawing the way the bricks have to but the drawing has no gravity so if you if you draw a brick floating in air it will continue to float in air while the building has gravity so in in fundamentally changes the drawing is an architectural intent but it is not architecture so uh, in some sense when you translate ideas into buildings you you need that kind the context does play an important a very very heavy role in it um and in that sense when you talk about climate or different materials coming together or knowledge from the field we bank heavily on it we we are nothing without 
you know the last bit of my presentation we have no practice without those people who make our buildings and the make them to a degree of what we intend but our intention do not solely govern the buildings so as when as the design develops their inputs are also very very essential um, only a carpenter knows how which side which which uh, which side the grain of the wood is designed so and how we are going against the grain and all so you can't presume that knowledge uh, as an architect you can collaborate on an idea like that i feel and you can bridge that gap maybe and it's the whole true with content also you know um, uh, uh, when we come from sometimes a position of possessing knowledge we do not become seekers of knowledge somehow you know you it be, you become closed to and and in any project and in any of our editorial projects our curatorial projects uh, our design projects only 20% of it is strategic and all the strategies we make around it are really completely malleable and they change over time almost 80% of it at least for me and also i guess i i know for mansi they, they are intuitive uh moves we make a lot of intuitive moves so we look at print on two papers and we say oh this paper is much nicer and this feels right right now if somebody has it tells us that okay why don't you write to 100 words on why this paper feels right and why that doesn't we can't really you know it's not doesn't work somehow design is not to me at least it's not it is part intuition part strategy and you can always make your strategy clear but your intuition is not you know nothing you know why why blue i mean the blue feels right right but uh, why exactly blue i mean who who can tell so sometimes that that kind of a thing also happens you know serendipities to many projects and um, we have to i mean i want to stay open uh, and a lot of times i am not because i'm conditioned by the way i've uh, learned and i've brought up and i've lived my life so i'm not always open to that kind of knowledge but slowly as we are maturing uh, in our practice we have started becoming much more open to yeah uh, like anuj said no knowledge from the field like keeping the ear close to the ground that's a kind of a thing i think especially in the last 2 3 years we have talked started talking about terms like intent that you know what is the intent of the project and when once we start to articulate that then there are more i think once the architectural intent is drawn then there are conversations with the contractor and they started becoming more and more longer and over the past few years we are observing that we are spending more and more time uh, talking to these people and uh, talking to people who have an opinion um, on other things than just the architectural or material intent so you know it, it starts becoming that so the, the detailing or all those sort of conversations start coming in much later including paper uh, like he said that you know for the journal uh, i think that we have, we have changed the paper for the journal again and it sort of becomes that sort of a conversation because every time you have a very um, direct feedback and that is across our content and architecture projects so yeah yeah thank you that brings us to uh... uh oh there's a nine uh, uh, wait a minute okay uh, he or she says thank you uh so uh thank you uh, both of you i think uh, you know it was lovely uh, engaging with both of you and matter and the work of matter today because i think uh, what your practice also demonstrates is that in order to build agency architects have to actively kind of do a lot of things together and the principal ones being writing thinking and making together uh, and i am reminded of uh, you know one of the lectures by uh, yuan huang uh, who heads uh, the field office uh, in taiwan and um, he he uh, was he also kind of said that you know i spend my time partially between making and after 4 o'clock i just go down in my basement and write uh, you know so i think uh, it's a it's a very important kind of direction that you people are charting that that we have to actively get engaged not just in the boom of making but also contemplating on what we make and sometimes the making can uh, uh, be prefaced by 
by thinking itself and uh, your practices demonstrates that really so thank you thank so, you. Much, uh, so much so much before we close you know i i yeah. just want to uh, say that um, the work um, um that you know there are a very few schools in india that we kind of um, um uh, admire in terms of their position the position that they have taken in um the kind of context we live in now and uh, csea is one of them and uh, we were very happy to actually receive your invitation um and to present this uh, so thank you for that and uh, the other thing i really wanted to say is that the uh, we believe truly that the space of practice is going to change over the next few years and fun- the that fundamental change will only come from pedagogy it will not come from practice you a very few people will have you know like change of hearts midway in their 50s now and the kind of offices they've created will continue to exist and the damage they they have have done they will continue to do however we have a chance um, a unique opportunity to change this narrative over and especially we in the world that we live in um, which has so many and now our fault lines have become so visible in the last 10 years uh, you know the 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 religious extremism the kind of political narrative uh, uh, the kind of projects that are forced down our throat um, what is good architecture what is bad everything is going to change and the the place where this can be questioned is the school and we both and mansi luckily had the chance to go back to school after quite a bit of years of practice and uh, and uh, i am also trying to seek that you know somehow crawl my way back into academics uh, through my maybe like a masters we have explored all sorts of things but but in in some way i feel that the fundamental change of thinking will come from the school and and um it cannot it, it and it can, you cannot even task practitioners i mean they'll they'll get it all wrong you know if you task practitioners to um change the direction uh, uh where of of practice itself yeah um i i feel and and therefore i i think that the work that you do is is fundamental to this change uh so yeah i just wanted to say that before we close you know thank you thank you so much and we really appreciate that feedback uh, from you and i feel that uh, pedagogy and practice have to together kind of uh, you know rethink uh, and reorient to the future uh, of architectural practice so with that i think uh, i invite you to join our remaining conversation at the building agency Uh, which will uh, the next uh, session of which will happen on 23rd july that is a fortnight later and we'll be inviting social design collab from delhi who will talk uh, about their experiments with uh, architecture in space so uh, thank you so much and uh, see you all um, and sajju singh is saying to end uh, this is the longest webinar i've attended and happily so wonderful to see so much wisdom in people so yeah thank you sajju uh, thank you, uh, uh, thank thank you so you. much for that feedback thank you thank you and see you thank next uh, fortnight later bye 23rd right 23rd yeah. 23rd okay. yes have yeah. a nice weekend thanks thanks bye. so much thank thanks you. rupali thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.